information, just a little bit of um, uh, housekeeping. Uh, this will be recorded and the recording will be available um, to all people who have registered. You'll get an email about it. It will also be available on our web website as well as the deck. So um, first of all, I'm Joanne Beers. I'm the Vice President of Client Engagement for Turnkey and I'm very excited to have my two panelists here today. Um, I have uh, Robin Patterson from Cystic Fibrosis. Kelly, can you advance the slides, please? Um, and Cindy Yomantis from the National MS Society. So go ahead to the next one. Thank you. So I'm going to ask Robin, first of all, to tell us a little bit about herself, um, please. Sure. Hi, everybody. It's great to be with you all today. Thanks for tuning in and making the time. Uh, my name is Robin Patterson, and I am the Senior Director of National Peer-to-Peer -Peer Campaigns for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. I've been with the foundation for nearly 13 years and have served in a variety of strategy and support roles throughout that time, both at the chapter level and national level. In my current role, I work with a team um, nationally to develop and implement the strategic direction of our peer-to-peer -peer campaigns, which includes our walk program, Great Strides, Cycle, Hike, and Climb. And we work with our fundraising teams and what we call chapters across the country to implement the strategies at a local level. Our peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaign includes a total of 461 events. That's across walk, cycle, hike, and climb. Uh, the majority of that, as you can imagine, is our walk program, which has 381 events alone and represents about $45 million. And 45 million is what we raised in 2019. Um, heading pre-COVID numbers, as we were asked to kind of share today a little bit of that information, uh, we were really starting off the year strong this past year. It is also our 65th anniversary, so had a nice opportunity to tie in a, light, a lot of nice uh, pieces around our 65 Roses theme and 65th anniversary. I saw a very strong start to the year, so like all of you, it was definitely a, a hit when COVID hit us, and we had to pivot and really start thinking differently about how we approached our efforts uh, with our community. Uh, before Right at the start of COVID, we had just raised about $6 million across our peer-to-peer -peer events, and we're heading into the thick of our Great Strides walk season, where about 90% of our walk events occur in the month of April and May, and almost all in one weekend in the month of May as well. And today, uh, we have raised about $12.5 million across all of our peer-to-peer -peer events. So in that time frame, we saw about $7 million come in across those 12 weeks, which we're actually pretty pleased with. And I think all of us will probably admit that we've all adjusted our feelings on performance and fundraising in this COVID moment and are learning kind of a new normal with that. Uh, performance wise, uh, prior to COVID, we generally see about 50% participant performance across our campaigns. It's generally higher for our endurance events um, and a little bit below 50% for great strides, but on average about 50%. We've definitely seen a drop across our programs and performance, but feel that that's really as a, as a result of some decisions we've made as an organization in response to this time, which we're gonna cover here in a little bit. Thank you, Robin, that was a great overview. So I'd like to introduce Cindy now, Cindy Yomantis from the National MS Society, and will you tell us a little bit about your events? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, sure will. Thanks so much for having me here today and um, look forward to sharing some of our learnings um, with, with the group. And um, I, th I feel like I need to, first of all, though, Joanne, give a shout out to you and to certainly um, Turnkey. You guys have held like so many sessions um, for a number of us uh, working in the nonprofit area and of course all of these uh, webinars and I will say that in those early days, sometimes they felt like therapy sessions just to keep us going, but you know, very much appreciate um, you know, what you've done and, and the role you've played um, you know, during this uh, certainly historic um, experience for all of us. So, so wanted to give you a shout out, um, okay. first of all. Yeah, really, really, yeah, really appreciate it. So I've worked at the um, National MS Society for uh, 11 years. Um, I am currently the Associate uh, Vice President of Walk MS uh, Event Experience. 
and I've held that role for, I think it's like four years at this point, three, four years at this point. And I'm part of a, a four person um, Walk MS leadership team. And we work with about uh, a little over 80 staff members across the country who are focused exclusively on Walk MS. Um, in my role, uh, which uh, you know now includes virtual, so something we hadn't anticipated, you know, prior to uh, prior to March of this year, but uh, truly a, a strong focus on our event experience. And that's on event and what happens um, when uh, our participants have that opportunity to gather in person. Um, and as I said, now focused uh, as well on what that looks like when we come together virtually. Um, I also help craft and, and lead our work on um, our Walk MS strategic and operational plan. So um, involved uh, in that. And I will say that, um, you know, part of the strategic work we were doing um, was to to begin to look at our on-event Walk MS experience, and we had anticipated piloting a new um, experience next year. So, because of the pandemic, some of that work is going to be delayed a little bit, but um, we'll uh, probably have some new learnings um, for that as well because of what's happened over the course of the last few months here. Um, with regard to the Walk MS campaign, uh, we host uh, 355 events um, across the country. Um, our, our year really runs from October through September, although we have the majority of our events um, occurring in the spring. And um, we were working strategically to, to even um, realign some of those outliers to really have a focus in the spring. So I would say <clears throat> at least 90% of our events are occurring um, uh, in that sweet spot of uh, you know, March, April, and May. Um, we engage about 230,000 participants and volunteers uh, in those events. Um, we, prior to the uh, pandemic, um, as Robin was talking about, um, we, were, we were likewise, we were having a spectacular year. And that's, you know, that's one of those things that, you know, we definitely are, are holding on to and remembering um, as we, we have this new experience with the pandemic. But, you know, coming into March, um, our numbers, we were a million up um, and we were feeling great about the, um, you know, what was ahead of us and how prepared we were to, uh, to really win this year. So um, we generally bring in, our campaign will generally bring in about a, about a million dollars, or $40 million, I'm sorry, about a $40 million, $40 million campaign. And um, now as we sit really on the, um, I don't know, on the other side of our spring campaign, because we've completed well, with this weekend, we'll have completed 330 events virtually. So the lion's share of our, um, of our events have happened. And we're tracking at about 21 million. So we're looking at you know, um, about 50% of what we anticipated um, in revenue for this year. And our, our participant numbers are about 40%. Of, of what we were looking at. So as far as, far as our performance, um, you know, with 330 events under our belt. Thank you, thank you, Cindy. So um, I failed to mention that if you have questions, um, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So please, uh, please submit your questions and we'll try to get to them. And uh, in some cases we may stop and answer them. In some cases we might wait till the end. But I'm going to start with Robin. Um, we've already talked about um, uh, the organization a little bit, but um, you, the way that you're structured is somewhat different from the way NMSS is structured in that you work with the chapters. Can you describe that briefly, Robin? Sure. So we are a national organization with approximately 500 employees across the country, and we are structured that we have a national office located in Bethesda, Maryland and then about 70 chapters and branch offices located across the country, which we've mentioned we call chapters. Um, my team works directly with the chapters to help them with implementing national strategy locally and really coaching them on best practices, um, implementation of you know, national messaging, national strategies I mentioned. Um, and that's really kind of how we work across programs. Um, so really across peer to peer themed events, individual giving, that's how we work with our chapters. Okay, great, thank you. And Cindy, you were organized differently, so can you briefly explain that? 
Sure. Yeah, happy to. Um, I would say it was in uh, about three years ago, um, our organization underwent a um, restructure and we're now, um, we're realigned and we use a mate, what's called a matrix structure. And um, really in simple terms, um, what that means is like, we're, we're, um, we're organized along functional areas. So for instance, all of the, the Walk MS team, you know, reports up through with coordinators, specialists, managers, directors, senior directors, all the way up to a vice president of that Walk MS group. Um, likewise, we'll have another functional area for our Bike MS um, uh, event, and that's, a, that's a, our largest property. That's a $65 million property. Um, the same for event production, for our finance areas. So we all work in, in functional areas. We have staff are seated across the country, and we have 30 plus chapters across the country, so they're seated there, but they, um, they work and they report up through their functional areas. Okay, well, great, well, thank you. So let's get right into it. So Robin, when uh, the pandemic hit and you had to pivot, um, what did you decide to do and how did you go about making your decision? Well, when COVID hit, I think we were all in shock, as we've all said, right, and have been building our list, I, we call buzzwords, uh, every day. Pivot seems to be top of the list because that, I think, is used in every meeting that we're a part of. Reimagine, you've all heard as well, numerous times. Um, but really, when COVID hit, we made the decision as an organization based on input from our volunteers and our community which is really made up mostly of inner circle supporters. So CF families and their friends and family. And really put the health and safety of our community first. Due to the high risk nature of cystic fibrosis, um, we made the decision to cancel or postpone all in-person events through June 30th to really not put them at risk by bringing them together in a community setting. And we also made a big decision as an organization, which I think was, was hard for a lot of us at first, but to cease fundraising messaging at that point in time and to really redirect and focus our efforts on engagement. Uh, we really believed uh, that it was the right time and the right message to put out that we didn't wanna ask for funds and donations at that point in time when people were all getting used to this new normal, uh, really not sure what the next week was gonna bring, uh, both personally, mentally, financially, uh, physically. I think we all went through various changes at that point in time um, and we, we really based that on support and input from the community. They felt strongly that that was the right decision for us to make. And it definitely has resulted that it was a great decision for us to make. Well, and thank you. And we're we're going to talk a little bit more about um, those engagement things that you did. But um, before we do that, Cindy, um, so how did you make your decision and what did you decide to do? Because you all did it a little bit differently. Yeah, yeah, we did. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't know, listening to, to Robin, um, you know, talk about those early days, you know, certainly, you know, it, bring, it brings back those memories. And I feel like, you know, the, the start of, you know, this pandemic and suddenly having, you know, COVID in our, you know, vocabulary, it's just, it's one of those things that you'll probably remember, you know, you'll always remember where you were, at least those of us in this industry, when you, you know, you were faced with like, so what do we do? you know, this is happening, what do we do? Um, and I distinctly remember it was, you know, March 11th. And um, we were, I mean, we were like 12 events into our, you know, our spring, um, our spring campaign. And, um, you know, and that's when everything, you know, nationally just started shutting down. I think that's, that's the day the NBA, you know, canceled their season, you know, shortly after that, no final four, um, you know, all of these things happening. And it was, you know, it was just really clear that it was not going to be business as usual. Um, and so within, really within a week of that happening and um, looking at March 18th, we announced that we had made that decision to hold 330 of our um, spring events. So going all the way to the end of June, um, that we would conduct those virtually. Um, we in those, you know, so there were, there were, there were very few days to, um, you know, to, to arrive at this decision because we were, you know, we were in the midst of our campaign. Um, and so, you know, we, we briefly considered, you know, do you look at postponing, you know, is this something that we try to, you know, we, we try to re, um, 
you know, uh, reschedule um, for later um, in the year. And um, really based on the, on the volume of events and the complexity of putting these events together, um, also, the fact that we did have the Bike MS series that happens predominantly, um, you know, in the fall. Um, and then really, you know, what we were hearing, you know, as far as the science and what we might expect in the fall, um, you know, all of those things combined told us, you know, we need to, you know, we need to just make this decision, make the shift to, uh, you know, to virtual. Um, and we also, because we had everything in place, you can imagine all of our team raisers, everything was all launched, all the dates, all the locations, everything was out there. Um, we determined that, you know, we would, we would conduct virtual and we would just keep all of that in place. Um, that there also, you know, wasn't really a time or an opportunity or resources for us to um, dramatically change the structure of how we would um, activate our walks. So, so again, that decision, you know, within the course of a week of, you know, um, everyone finding that um, their world had had changed, um, uh, we made the decision to, um, you know, to go virtual. And the thing I would, the thing I would add there, because we, you know, we lived for a little bit in the gray. So we were, you know, we were in that situation where we were having to make decisions and we were doing that on a week by week basis, you know, based on municipalities and whether we were able to gather or not. Um, uh, you know, will we have an event this weekend? Yes for this one, no for that one. Um, the, once, once we made the, you know, the decision, I would, I would just share with everyone that that just brought incredible, like, it, you know, just, I, I don't, clarity and the ability to focus. And I think, you know, with that ability to focus, it also allowed us to elevate our performance because we weren't straddling, uh, well, it could happen this way or it might happen that way. It was like, no, this is what we've determined. Um, this is what Walk MS, you know, will be. And it was, it was easier for staff and easier for our participants, I think, to just kind of, you know, wrap their arms around that and, you um, you know, I, and again, I think have a better outcome um, because we, you know, we had made that decision. Thank you, Cindy. Mm -hmm. So, so Robin, you all decided not to have individual virtual events, but one of the things that you had talked to me about was um, virtual in the past was just uh, sign up as a virtual walker and, and fundraise. So now you had to figure out what was that virtual experience going to be and, and Tell, tell the group about how you decided to ha have one big event with a lot of other things underneath it. Yeah, and I would say, you know, our approach was definitely a little bit different because um, we are still in this transition to virtual mode as I was sharing with Cindy. We're actually internally launching our peer-to-peer -peer events virtually right after this call. Nothing like our busy schedule, right? Especially during these COVID times. Um, but back in the spring, because we made the decision to focus efforts on engagement, we definitely took a different approach with that engagement in mind. And we really looked at it as a community-wide approach. How can we engage the community locally and nationally, keep them together, show support, give them an outlet to come together to communicate, to vent, right? Which we all needed. I love, Cindy, that you made that comment. It's so true. And to support one another. And our CF community, because of the high risk nature, and some of them will tell you that, you know, they've been six feet apart before it was cool because it's just been a part of what they have been, it's part of their care routine to stay six feet apart from other patients that have cystic fibrosis to really lessen the risk of infection, you know, cross infection. Um, also, you know, they wear masks pretty regularly. A lot of them don't come to our in-person events because of that risk of, cro of cross infection. So we even, as a result of going to this virtual engagement side, saw that we had new people come because they had never come in person before because in person was that only option. We hadn't offered these virtual engagement opportunities before and ways for them to come together through a virtual, I wouldn't call it an event, but in a virtual really opportunity. Um, and so we first started by putting on the map on the timeline our 65 Roses Day, June 5th and creating a large national community-wide celebration of our 65th anniversary. So really a reason for our community to come together 
on a national digital platform. We utilized Digitel for that event. And then we worked backwards. So we kind of took a look at the timeline. So what can we do leading up to that event to bring the community together through virtual engagement opportunities that are locally driven by the chapters, but then are also a part of a national cohesive consistent approach because it was very important to us that our messaging looked the same and the look and feel felt the same, but that we didn't take away from that localization and flair that each of our chapters bring within their markets. And so we launched what we called pep rallies and we put together a full plan for what a pep rally should look like, work with an internal team to develop scripting, imagery, social graphics, you name it, really every, all the support materials that you would for any type of event, and roll that out across the field. And would echo what Cindy shared, you know, that once we were able to roll out those materials and direction and structure and timeline, there was like immediately this creation of focus for our field staff who are all working remotely and many of them for the first time working remotely. And it then resulted in a tie into the elevation of performance. And we definitely saw a lot of people then just click into gear, be able to grasp onto this and run with the creativity and development of this new concept. In addition to the rallies, our chapters then looked for creative ways to bring the community together through additional opportunities, everything from a grandparent story time, which we call our grandparents grampians, uh, to CF adult happy hours. Um, there were also talent shows done virtually. There was even a face mask fashion show I saw in Chicago. Um, our chapters really got creative with looking for ways to bring the community together. And that really was our theme was together. So keeping everyone together and really focusing on that engagement which results in retention. Because we wanted to make sure when we got through this all, that they were, we were all still here and that we weren't having to start all over again with having to recruit our community and bring them back into the fold. We knew we could phase fundraising back in eventually and built that plan out as well so that we have a phased approach to full-fledged fundraising. And as of today, we're back in full-fledged fundraising. So now we're launching this afternoon, how we incorporate that into this virtual engagement and now fundraising into the mix. And you actually saw new people come into the fold by, by engaging that way, right? Because it's the we did. And it's funny, we, we even heard on some of our national engagement opportunities that they were, they'd be sad someone shared when this is all over, which I don't think you'd think anyone would say, right? But they were sad for the right reasons and that they don't want to see this go away. And they were thrilled to hear that we don't either. This isn't a short-term approach for us. You know, what we've realized is that we don't want to create band-aids in this time. We want to look for things that are going to be long-term and really lead to longevity, things we can carry into 2021 and beyond to keep the community together and really add in as an and, not a we're either going to be in person or we're going to be virtual. We're going to be in person and virtual so that we can best support our community. Thanks. That's wonderful. Cindy, so um, how, what did you decide to do with your um, events and the, uh, the event experience and mm -hmm. getting everybody to participate, you know, for each of those different events. Right, you... right. Yeah, yeah. Big, big challenge there. Um, I wrote down, though, um, face mask fashion show. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's... <laughs> I can imagine that's going to be a standard for for a lot of us. So um, that is a that's a tremendous uh, tremendous idea. Um, well, we um, you know it was just thinking too. It's like we took we took that pause as well. I mean, and I think that was you know in those first couple of weeks in March where um, things were quiet. You know, just the whole, you know, just everybody, you know, trying to understand um, how they were going to function and and all the things that had changed in their lives. And and we um, we went dark with our you know recruitment and fundraising um, messaging there for um, for a short period of time too. Um, in our outreach, I would just say it's just this heightened um, heightened uh, amount of outreach, and then also um, leading with empathy. Um, that was pretty much, um, you know, the, uh, really the, you know, the, if you would, the marching orders um, for our, you know, our uh, connecting with our constituents. It was, it was really that, you know, um, checking in and, and finding out how people were doing because, you know, when you reflect back to what everything felt like in March, I mean, that was just, you know, that was appropriate for how you, you know, 
how you just care about each other. Um, and, and that includes, you know, our, our participants. So, um, so we, we did a lot of, a lot of that, um, uh, in those first couple of weeks. And then, um, we held uh, what we called our team captain um, virtual meetups. So um, all across the country during a, you know, a, a, a two week period of time, um, we had staff um, inviting team captains to come together um, virtually and, um, you know, and, and talk with them. Part of that was to, to see how they were doing from a wellness perspective. I mean, we gave them, similar to how you started this call, we had a poll, you know, on a scale of one to 10. And I think one was feeling like it was the zombie apocalypse. And, you know, 10 was like, it's, you know, rainbows and unicorns. It's kind of like, how are you feeling? Um, so we could just see, you know, just, just, just what was the mindset of, um, you know, of our, our key participants, our team captains. And then the other, the other poll in the discussion that we, that we had during that, um, those sessions was to ask them how they felt about fundraising. And there it was, you know, kind of the same thing. One, it's like, I'm, you know, terrified and, you know, 10 or whatever, five is I'm I, business as usual. And what was interesting with, with that is that, um, and it was a one to five, as I remember the scale, and they came back um, a three. So it was, you know, hey, it's it's going to be tough, but this cause matters to me, and we and we're going to ask. You know, we're we we are definitely going to be fun. You know, we're we're going to be fundraising. We're not fear. We're not fe we're fearful of it, but we're that doesn't mean we're not going to ask. And we felt like that gave us permission to just really like reboost and and reboot our campaign. Um, and, and we did. And so, um, you know, a couple of things that, you know, then happened with regard to, you know, Joanne, as you're asking about the events themselves and, and what we did to, um, you know, to make virtual, um, you know, compelling. Um, uh, it was, you know, just a, certainly it's a lot of sharing and equipping our staff with information that they could share um, with our participants about what virtual meant. Um, a lot of this language about, you know, it's walk MS your way, um, you know, your opportunity to determine, determine what was, what is right. Our, our marketing department all absolutely came up with a, a an ingenious um, drawing that showed what your walk um, route could be like um, if you were walking in your home. Um, so we're sharing that on social media. So where the rest stop was in the kitchen and, <laughs> you know, all these, um, all these things. So, um, so doing, you know, doing what we could to share, you know, thoughts and ideas about, um, you know, enjoying um, that, that virtual experience. Cause we also knew it was dramatically different. You know, the, what people could do in New York city, for instance, was dramatically different from Kansas city. So, um, you know, so trying to meet people, you know, where they were with, with their options might be. Um, and one more thing to add is we did do um, Facebook live broadcasts and we did about eight of those over the course of um, our spring campaign. And um, we would rally, you know, um, you know, obviously groups or, you know, certain markets to um, each of those weekends. And then um, did a lot of storytelling um, and featured some of our fundraisers and our participants. And really our goal with those was to, you know, have it, they were always about a 30 to 45 minute session and to make sure that when, you know, when the viewers exited um, those sessions that they just took with them that feeling that they get at walk, you know, that it, that was carrying them through like that really good feeling of, you know, community and, and seeing others and hearing inspiring stories. So, um, so that was another piece that we added to, um, you know, to, to help people retain what, what they've told us is really special about walk. So um, we've got a couple questions from the audience, um, and they're both uh, around the technical services that you use. So you talked about using Facebook Live. Um, were there any other platforms that you used uh, or the different chapters used besides that for the individual event day? Um, for us, it was it was Facebook Live, you know, broadcasting there, um, you know, promoting, of course, through Facebook, you know, Instagram, you know, um, all the social media um, channels. And then for our, like our virtual meetings, it was uh, GoToMeeting um, predominantly that we were using for those um, virtual sessions with our team captains. Okay. And uh, Robin, you mentioned uh, digital that you use. Um, how do you spell that? Just like digital? digital? 
Yes, it's B-I-G-I-T-L. We use that for our national event on June 5th, um, which is an event production company that we even utilize for our volunteer leadership com conference annually. For our pep rallies, we utilized Blue Jeans uh, with Facebook Live. So uh, we utilized the Blue Jeans platform and then streamed live through the Facebook Live so that we could reach really as many participants as possible, but also have the ability to have multiple speakers, a slide deck, uh, you name it, and it it worked well. Did it go without glitches? No, um, as all technology does, but the feedback that we received from our survey was really positive in that people noted there were glitches, but it didn't take away from the experience, and it actually helped make it feel more real, which was really nice to hear that, and not really surprised. I think we all expect technology to not go 100% for most of the time. <laughs> right, right, well, and I think people are forgiving in this period of time, knowing that everybody's doing something new. Well, thank you. Um, so uh, you, you both talked about how you handled fundraising. Um, and uh, um, in, do you have any specific, Robin, uh, situation? Well, you're just starting this. It were, people were doing fundraising before. Anything that you learned from your, your group? Yeah, I mean, they're going to do it now. Absolutely. A big thing that we definitely learned is that, you know, even though we ceased messaging around fundraising, fundraising didn't stop. Um, so the number one asked question through our main inbox was, where do I mail my checks, uh, which was really great to see. And that provided some positive momentum to both our team and to our chapters in the field to hear that that was still being communicated. Uh, we also saw as a result of not even asking, you know, across the four weeks that pep rallies were held, two and a half million dollars was raised across the organization, which was a really nice response that we saw from our community without having to push them. So it, it really did help gear us up. And then on June 5th, our national event, we did make our big ask. That was our launch, what we called our springboard back into the next phase, or into the next phase of fundraising for us. And we had a large national match offered by a family out of Washington uh, that really inspired sustainer giving. So it was focused on making new monthly gifts to the organization, and it really didn't matter where you made it. We have monthly giving options across many of our events that we do, and we saw a great response, uh, met our match goal within just a few short days, and have increase sustainer giving as a result. But that has really kind of springboarded us now into this next phase, which we're all eager to get started and are launching here at 3.30 this afternoon, Eastern time. So <laughs> wish us luck. <laughs> yes, good luck. So uh, Cindy, do you have anything to add to that about what you all learned about fundraising during um, this yeah, time? Yeah, just, um, well, maybe just a couple of things. Um, I think the the biggest takeaway and um, is actually, um, it's some of our staff members who fundraise, you know, have walk MS teams and then also some of our, our participants as well um, shared with us um, because, you know, there was some angst on the part of the staff. It's like, do I ask, you know, is it appropriate to, um, to be out there with a, with a fundraising, um, you know, request right now and, um, and, and what, what we were told and what we learned um, is like, you don't, don't decide for your donor. If they're if they're ready to fundraise, um, let them you know tell you. So you know put the ask out there and um, and they'll let you know you know if they're ready um, if they're ready to make a contribution. So um, so I think for us and again you know if we marry that with uh, with the work we did with our team captains, it just um, you know it 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 helped us um, to feel right and appropriate about, you know, getting out there with, uh, you know, some fundraising um, asks. And then the other, the other thing I would share, and I think it's, I mean, it was different for us because we were in that, you know, that, that March timeframe, but, you know, it's, we don't know where all of this is going and it could reemerge, but um, for our staff, they would find that, um, especially dur during those stay at home, you know, periods, um, people were picking up the phone and they wanted to talk. So, yeah, so it's like just to anticipate that you could have, um, and it's a good thing, I mean, you could have 
um, you know, more and um, longer and, and more engaged, you know, conversations with participants um, because there's not as much getting in the way of them, you know, um, you know, uh, again, picking up that phone and uh, they're looking for, you know, information and wanting to hear, you know, how this campaign that they care about is doing. So, um, so that's just, you know, that, that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, well, thank you. So, uh, Robin, I, I have a question for you, but before I get to that question, I know one of the things that you mentioned to me was it was it was a little bit of a challenge for some of your staff in picking up the phone, and you had to, you know, that was uh, one of the, um, you know, a lot of a lot of people are so used to emailing or texting or whatever. Um, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I would echo what Cindy just said that. What we did find though is that people were home, right? So it, it surprising was a lot easier to get people on the phone. Whereas before COVID, you know, we would definitely leave a lot of messages, voicemails, call again and again, right, to try and get somebody on the phone. Um, but when we first switched over to engagement and focused efforts in that regard, we did find that some staff found it hard to just pick up the phone. They immediately wanted to just stick with email. Um, and in some regards, almost saw that as a call, like that's how they communicated with that individual. And so had to really talk them through, you know, because the question came up, what do I say? What do I say when they pick up the phone? And I think the simplest response we gave was, hi, how are you, <laughs> right? How are things going? Like Cindy said with the poll, how are you feeling right now? And even, you know, without bringing up fundraising, if they did, we had a conversation with them. It was really what Cindy said held true for us as well as letting them really direct the conversation and tell us what they were comfortable doing and not doing. And that really guided those efforts. And it, just by simplifying that step in the process definitely helped. And we saw a lot of people then get more comfortable picking up the phone. I even heard a few staff say to me that they were on more calls than they've ever been on throughout their 10 years with the organization. They had more conversations about virtual engagement than ever before and just never expected that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but COVID does, did different things to us, as we all know. Right. Well, that was certainly a, a positive, I think, for a relationship uh, building. Um, so the question I have for you, Robin, is what did your pep rally entail? Also, were you concerned or have you seen that having too many engagement events leading up to the big 65th celebration started to have people fall off from their participation due to too many online activities. The feedback we've received is that people are starting to get burnt out from the endless computer Zoom sessions. Virtual fatigue is actually fatigue. now a term for that. Uh, sunburn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's a great question and there's, there's two parts to it. So yes, our pep rallies definitely had a structure to them. We build out full structure, scripting, imagery, as I mentioned, social graphics, uh, you name it. All of that did include the option to localize and customize. So we utilized internally, we use Canva really as a great resource that we're able to input then nationally driven materials, but our chapters are then able to go in and customize it locally so that they can add in local names for recognition for sponsors or volunteers. Uh, they can add even additional images to it but it still kept it cohesive. Um, as for virtual fatigue, that was definitely a concern and a concern that was raised both internally across staff and from our volunteers. And so we worked when we launched the rallies and that structure and timeline to really message out internally to take a look at the cadence that they had currently situated for their virtual engagement opportunities in their chapter and to consider dialing it back because we did have some chapters that were starting to get into the met mode of having three to four per week, which was definitely causing some virtual fatigue. And those chapters were also seeing that participation was lessening. So those were just conversations and really talking through, what are you doing in the chapter? How many are you hosting a week? Are you targeting it towards a certain audience? Is there a topic that's driving those calls? Like really understanding the why behind there were being held, why so many were being held. And then we were dialed it back to one to two per week. And we still had concerns because it was new and we've never done it before that we might end up seeing a struggle with getting people to sign up then for that June 5th event because people did have to register through a platform for the event. 
And I'm happy to say we did not experience that. Uh, we had well over 2,500 people register for the event. Uh, we didn't get the response that they were fatigued at all from hosting, seeing the pep rallies. I think because they were locally driven, their community has got to go to one rally and then one June 5th event, and they were spaced enough apart that it didn't feel like overload to them. Uh, we sent out a survey post rally for every pep rally that was held to gather feedback both on the experience they had with their rally, but also on their experience with virtual events in general that we've already hosted. So that we could learn from the cadence of them, as I mentioned, how many to hold per week, um, the types of virtual engagement opportunities that we were hosting, and to really find out from them what we were missing, if there were things that they we weren't doing that they would like us to do differently, and saw positive feedback. They thought one to two per week was great, um, they really enjoyed what we had put out there, weren't tired, which we expected that they would have rated that they were. Um, I love the zombie apocalypse poll. I'm going to steal that, Cindy, and throw that somewhere fun. And they also noted that they are excited to, to attend more and will attend more, which was really great to see. So I think it's just noting your cadence and making sure that you're targeting an audience, a specific audience, and topicing your calls so that you're not just sending it out there to everybody that's kind of where fatigue does come in when they're on many, many a week. Yeah, well, so, and you, you had talked to me about the fact that you had like some things for the grand grandpians and some things for the yeah. CF adults. And so not everybody was being invited to everything. Right, I mean, they were definitely targeted where calls were for CF moms, um, CF dads, CF adults. Uh, we had some for our grandpians, which were our grandparents. Uh, that are in the group. Tomorrow's leaders are young professionals, but they were definitely geared towards individual segments so that it, people were able to get onto multiple if they wanted to, but they didn't have to, that they could really pick and choose the calls that made the most sense to them. Okay, so we have another question, um, and I'll start with Cindy on this one. Did you offer incentives like t-shirts, et cetera? And I know we've had some conversations oh, about oh boy. That. <laughs> I have, in all honesty, I have, uh, I have the great, um, I don't know, challenge, honor of uh, trying to figure out how we distribute 34,000 t-shirts to our, um, to our fundraisers uh, without the ability to, uh, you know, we didn't have that in the budget to mail those and we'd normally distribute those on events. So um, we're working on that. Uh, so yeah, we, um, we, we kept because we were, you know, all of those things were already in motion. Um, people had already been, you know, in the, in the pre-pandemic world, they had already been fundraising and registering and, you know, and gearing up for those March, April, and, and May events. So, um, so we did, you know, we did um, continue to say, um, you know, the, our fundraising level is $100 to achieve a, a t-shirt, and that's still there. We have a, you know, a fundraising incentive program additionally, and, um, and that's still there. And of course, we're, um, you know, we're learning all the time about, you know, now some creative ways that we can make those, you know, that distribution happen um, uh, and, and watching a lot from how, you know, retail is, is doing this work. So um, whether that becomes curbside or, or something else, we'll, we'll make that happen. And, and one aside, because there was so much conversation about it, it's like, it is one of the top questions that people asked, will I still get my t-shirt? And um, we were a little, you know, almost perplexed about that in the beginning, but then, um, but then it really, it made sense because it was that memento of this, you know, of, of certainly this unique year and also this event that they love. Um, and they weren't going to have those pictures at Team Village or at the start line or, you know, those types of things. So, you know, so we get it, you know, it makes sense that they're, they're looking for those um, mementos. So we will, um, yeah, we continued to use those. We did, um, we did have um, uh, some promotions that we normally run and we backed off a little bit on those. Um, again, that was that, you know, that early period in March. Um, but otherwise, um, you know, pretty much status quo with, um, you know, with what we were offering. Um, and then I was going to, I was going to say, because Robin, it, you, you made me think about the, um, you know, you're talking about the frequency or, or whatever of the, you know, of the gatherings and is there fatigue. Um, you know, one thing I think that was a learning for us and that's new from, from you know, like working virtually is that, and, and you kind of touched on it, but it's that it's finding that, you know, people are really excited and interested in, um, in coming together in 
like different tribes, different ways, you know, whereas when we gather in person, we're so focused on that geographical location. So here we are, come on Chicago or, you know, wherever it's like, we're, you know, and everything rallies around that, you know, now we're starting to find that it's just like you said, it's team captains or it's rookies or whatever their affinity is or how they're, you know, engaged with the um, event itself. And then they're meeting people from whether it's all across a state or a region, you know, country, whatever, and they're getting excited about that. So, so it's like, there's some new energy, I think that, you know, that is going to come from that and something that, um, you know, we'll continue to explore. So, um, and, and, and liking that, I think there's a lot of opportunity there in the messaging we can do. Thanks, Cindy. So I'm going to ask Rob and you about the incentives, and then we're going to get to what's going to do next because we're running short on time or, or where we're going in the future. So can you tell us real fast about what you all did with, uh, with incentives? Sure, I can be fast. Um, so we're actually announcing it this afternoon, um, but we have made the decision to adjust our incentive program, which we call our recognition program. And that's really based on feedback from our community. They felt very strongly that we needed to dial it back quite significantly and really focus more just on offering a few levels, branded items only, so they could really wear those items proudly out within their communities. Um, and we've even added some special levels this year to just really acknowledge that there might be lower fundraising that occurs and also to pull through our 65th anniversary uh, note that we have across the organization this year. So we're adjusting. Um, it's, it's still going to be there. Our t-shirts aren't going anywhere, much like Cindy. That's definitely a question that we still get asked as well. And t-shirts are remaining. We're actually going to be adding a t-shirt for one of our events because they didn't have one and really just to build consistency. But what's been very nice is it's, it's really made us pause and look across our peer-to-peer -peer events to build more consistency across them, which is a really a long-term move for us, which we find to be smart, because it's funny when our volunteers even took a look at each track and saw the differences, the first question that I was asked was, why is it different? <laughs> and so we had to stop and ask that same question, but uh, we're rolling out some changes, but it's still going to be there this year. Okay, so let's talk about, I know you told me that you're focusing on like the next six months <laughs> and, and how to be, um, uh, make your virtual experience better. You want to talk about that for a minute? Sure. So with June, our June 5th event, we then use that as an opportunity, as I mentioned, to really launch our next phase of fundraising and to launch what we're calling our 65 Roses Challenge. So our organization has decided to come together as one organization for one goal to raise funds towards a $65 million goal year end. And peer-to-peer -peer is just a chunk of that $65 million goal. And through peer-to-peer, -peer, we have made the decision to transition all of our events to virtual. It will really be the exception where there will be an in-person event. Chapters have to submit an in-person assessment form, which means they're checking off all the boxes of safety guidelines and making sure they have all the safety protocols in place to be able to welcome someone to an in-person event. Uh, but the majority, by 98%, are going virtual. And we are right now building out what that virtual experience looks like. And when I say experience, I mean that wholeheartedly because as Joanne mentioned, we forever have had an option to register as a virtual participant, but that's really all it was. It was virtual registration. There was no experience part of it. You registered, you had a fundraising page, so you could be sending out emails, but there was no call to action or promotion of ride in your own neighborhood, walk in your own neighborhood, to do X, Y, and Z to really pull you together as part of that movement. And we are now moving in that direction. So really providing guidance to our community for how they can participate and support this 65 Roses Challenge by tying in the 65 number to some creative activities locally within their events. Uh, some chapters are looking at their events one for one and really staying within their lanes and peer to peer. Some chapters are also combining all of their peer to peer events into a week long effort or a weekend effort uh, and really looking for creative ways to bring that community together. You know, we've heard everything from car parades so far to um, create your own 65 challenge, like read 65 books, go swim 65 laps, um, get 65 donations, $65. It's funny, my team 
and I brainstormed one afternoon and we came up with 65 ideas pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> and really we're, we're focused on, as I mentioned, this next six months because we really aren't sure the direction this is going to take us. But the moves that we're making right now are not short-term moves. We're really making long-term moves that are going to impact us in 2021 and beyond. And that is our goal, is that what we do right now, whether it's you know, add a mobile app enhancement, because working on that too, adjust to our recognition program, establish new registration fees and fundraising minimums, uh, new looks or creative ways to engage our folks. All of that's gonna continue in the future. We're not just gonna go back to where we were. We want to just improve from where we are right now and continue to elevate the campaign moving into the future. So Cindy and um, Robin, We've been asked if you all can hang on for another five minutes. Do you both uh, do you both have things that you have to get off for? I can do five minutes. Okay. Yeah, likewise. Okay, so Cindy, I want to hear about what you're doing, but um, we did have a question that said, this is from Sarah Smith. Hi, Sarah, from Safe Passage, one of our clients. Um, she said that you had, I mentioned 50% revenue, 40% participants. That means that the participants are raising more. Mm -hmm. um, is, uh, is this a pattern across your participants or is it just due to a small number of high performers? Um, I think, I think what we're, um, you know, what we're seeing is that, and this is maybe, you know, not surprising, but for those people that, um, you know, really the, the mission is, you know, it's, is, is critical and so important to them, they remain engaged. Um, and so they, uh, you know, they continue to, they continue to step up. Um, the other, you know, the other thing that's reflective, uh, reflected in the, in that number for us this year is our national partners, um, that, and those were secured, of course, before, you know, the pandemic and, um, they stuck with us. So, you know, we are, you know, we discovered some, you know, always looking for new and creative ways to, you know, to activate their partnerships since we weren't going to be, you know, on event at, you know, 355 locations. Um, so, so that money was still there as well. So that stayed constant and as did, you know, for most of our sponsors, um, even at local levels that they stuck with the campaign. So, um, so it is reflective of that. I know I looked just the other day and if you, if you look at, you know, just the, the makeup of, of the people that are participating this year that registered, um, you know, it's a, the larger percentage are, you know, retained. So those people that, you know, have been with us in the past, now it's like a, they make up a bigger percentage. Well, part of that is because we have fewer new people. So that's something we're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to work on going forward. But, um, but yeah, the, the people that are with you are, um, you know, they're committed. Um, so they are, you know, they are definitely uh, all in is what we've experienced. Thank you. So in the next Two, three minutes. Can you just tell us what your plans are for the rest of this year and, um, and, and where you see these virtual events going forward into 2021? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I love what Robin um, was talking about and, and expressing as far as like, hey, the work we're doing now is work that's going to help us, you know, in the future that we see, you know, utilizing um, many of these approaches, if not all of them in the future. And, you know, and we feel the same way, because certainly we were, you know, we were in the same boat. Virtual for us was check a box. You know, there was a box when you registered, you could say virtual. And did anything else change? No, <laughs> nothing. So, um, you know, so we know that we've, we've got to continue to, you know, to elevate that experience. And, you know, and we also feel the same that regardless what we're doing in the future, I mean, that that elevated virtual experience is going to be a part of what we do. Um, you know, we anticipate that there's going to be, maybe it's always going to be a larger segment. I don't know, a smaller, who knows, um, but a segment of our audience that's always going to opt for virtual, that that's just going to feel, you know, it's just going to feel better, better to them. Um, and, and maybe they enjoy it more um, because of the way they can, um, they can activate. So, um, so we look at, you know, like really thinking about just what, you know, what virtual, you know, what that virtual experience can be um, and how we can elevate it um, going forward. And as far as decisions that we've made so far, we, we did just recently announce through September 30th, so that's the end actually of our fiscal year, 
um, through September 30th, all of our events will be virtual. So that added, you know, now it's like 342 uh, virtual events um, for this campaign. Um, and then we're starting to model, you know, scenarios and we're talking about, you know, what is, you know, what does 21 look like? Um, you know, and hoping that we can get to that, you know, that same point that we were able to arrive at, um, you know, in spring of being able to make a decisive, you know, decision about, you know, just what this, what the campaign is going to look like, um, so that we can really, you know, focus efforts, um, focus efforts on it. And um, the other, the other thing is we feel that we can, we can, we can still um, improve the performance, our revenue performance and our participation numbers. Um, we think, you know, based on what we've, what we've learned, uh, um, what we've heard, and then kind of the landscape that we're in right now, which is, you know, so very different from those first weeks of March, um, that we are anticipating that we will um, continue it to, uh, to improve our, our um, outcomes. Um, you know, regardless of whether we're, you know, we're, we're, how much virtual we're doing and um, if we're gathering in person. One more quick question. Um, Brian uh, has asked about uh, most of your um, audience expects this large in-person event and they would have expected you to go virtual. He says, any tips for engaging supporters virtually that aren't used to attending annual in-person events? And I know, uh, Cindy, you told me about, um, you have this event that you've, uh, one of your uh, chapters does, I believe, in um, Illinois or something that's been virtual for a number of years, right? Yeah, we actually, we had, um, uh, it was a team. So it was one of our um, team members and it was, I mean, it was excellent to be able to talk talk with him about um, what he'd been doing. He'd 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 flipped to virtual for his team experience. Um, I don't know, probably four or five years ago, um, and you know, shared with us just you know what were the things that made that um, you know made that more appealing um, for him and for his participants, and you know, and that's where we heard things like. Um, you know, with virtual, I can have people from all across the country and actually the world participate on my team. And that got to be something that was even a goal for them. You know, like how many states can we have represented on our team or how many countries? Um, the other piece was um, logging steps um, and being able to um, do some, you know, competition that way that that was something that was, you know, um, important to his, his team. Um, certainly sharing, a lot of sharing on social media. And he was, he was, as a team captain, I mean, he was just incredible with this. And, you know, sharing the photos he was receiving of people, you know, walking at, you know, various locations across the country and um, letting people know what their results were. So, you know, just heightened communication that he was doing to team members as well. So we, you know, we actually through, you know, just through that, that single conversation learned a lot about, you know, what some of the key factors were to get people excited about virtual and, you um, you know, and I'll, and I'll add one, one other thing we did, um, and I know we're running out of time here, but um, it was to, we, we hadn't had this before and we launched a team captain Facebook group. And um, I will tell you, we've got um, more than 1400 um, uh, members for that group right now. And it is just pure gold. Um, it's almost like you just sit back and watch and they tell you, you know, like, what's fun about virtual or, you know, hey, what questions do they have? I mean, that's where I saw um, a team, uh, you know, put to use, uh, you know, uh, pool noodles for social distancing, you know, and they're walking. I mean, you know, it's like the creativity, like you were saying, Robin, the creativity that comes, you know, from, you know, from our participants is just, it's just so inspiring. And you could see that they were, you know, fully embracing and wrapping their arms around it and then sharing that with each other and helping each other. And, hey, how do I do a video? Well, hey, I can show you how I use, you know, this is the tool I use. And, um, you know, that's something that, are we keeping that? Absolutely. You know, we'll continue to, you know, to, to provide that opportunity for team captains to connect. And um, like I said, we just learn, we learn so much from it. So, um, and, and that's the other thing, we'll just continue to learn from participants as we, you know, we work our way through, you know, what, what comes next. Well, thank you. We have run over and I certainly appreciate it, Robin and Cindy, so much great information. I think we could have talked for another hour. 
but uh, we all are busy, so I will let you go. Robin, great success with your launch. I'm sure it will be, it will do really well, and I can't wait to hear about it. Thank you. Well, thanks for inviting me today. Today was great, and shout out to you, Joanne, for keeping us together today. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate it, and thanks to all the participants, and uh, uh, we will be um, posting, uh, we will be sending you out the webinar um, recording. Come to our website, you can get recordings from all our webinars. And uh, thanks again for everyone. Thanks, thanks so much. All. Good luck, Cindy. Take care. Good luck the year. Yep, you too. Good luck, Robin. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.